Okay, welcome guys. Can you give another spotlight up this side here? Yeah, this is the road of the background. The background lights are fine, but the spotlights are still fine. Spotlights, okay. Shall we do this? More light options. More light options. Wait for the screen. Front lights? Side it? No. Back lights, left lights? Right lights. Right lights. Yeah. Good. We're all good. Okay, guys, we're ready to rock and roll. Let's do it. So tonight's talk is Space Telescopes Part 2. Last year, the end of last year, we did the first two talks on telescopes. There was ground-based telescopes, our first talk, which we talked about three large telescopes and the uh, pros and cons and what happens at the centres. Then we did Space Telescope Part 1, where we focused on three important and famous telescopes. Um, so tonight you're going to learn about three more important space telescopes. I decided to split it up into two. So, that is, I've split it into two halves, as well, two, two sections anyway. Uh, firstly, for those of you people who weren't here last year, or new members, or whatever, it doesn't get to a bit of revision of the principles of light and telescopes, and then we'll talk about the three famous space telescopes in the rest of tonight. So a little bit about light, or electromagnetic radiation, if you will. It's a spectrum, and light is best considered as waves of electric and magnetic energy of various wavelengths and energy levels. So starting at this end here, very, very short wavelengths, highly energetic gamma rays, and then with increasing wavelengths and reducing energy for each photon or particle of light, if you will, and you've got X-rays, ultraviolet, optical or visible light that we see, and then you've got the stuff that we don't see, which is the weak infrared, microwaves and radio waves. What I like about this, this little, uh, slide as well, it gives you an idea of the actual size of these wavelengths, like 10 to the minus 5 nanometers, that's a millionth of a millionth of a centimetre. That's how tiny the wavelengths are from these um, crazily powerful ground rays, camera rays. Right at the other spectrum, look, you've got radio waves that are up to a kilometre in wavelength. So what a contrast between the whole spectrum. The other thing just to mention here with uh, the principles of, of light is that our atmosphere absorbs and distorts most of the light that comes to Earth from out in space. Um, you certainly can see here with the gamma rays, the X-rays and the ultraviolet are all absorbed by Earth's atmosphere. There's a nice tiny little window with a visible or optical light that's able to get through that of course we see, that's convenient. Infrared's a bit patchy, some get through a little bit, mostly it's blocked. Um, so the, the microwaves are usually so a fair bit of blockage going on. It's a lovely window here for the radio astronomers, and then the longer wavelengths they get blocked again. The relevance of all this, of course, is leading up to space telescopes. So astronomy pre-1960, before the space age, pretty much all made telescopes were all pretty much there, <coughs> ground-based. Um, and of course they were remote for two reasons. One is to get away from light pollution in cities and so on, if you were dealing with optical wavelengths. If you're dealing with radio telescopes, they wanted to be remote, getting away from microwave ovens and um, <coughs> mobile phones and so on, all the chitter chat and noise that us humans were creating. They were also elevated um, sites for two reasons. One is to get higher up in the atmosphere, the atmosphere is going to be thinner and it's going to be colder, so you're going to have less turbulence on. The second reason why you want to be nice and elevated is you're up above most of the water vapour. Water vapour is a very powerful absorber of infrared wavelengths. If you get above 3,000 metres, you're up not above 90% of the Earth's water vapour. Atmospheric water vapour. So you're, getting a, a, you're immediately getting access to these sort of the near infrared wavelengths. In the 1960s onwards, along came the space age, and along with rockets came space telescopes. Um, over 80 space telescopes have been launched since 1965. You know, so, so the advantages, you can see the advantage of getting above the atmosphere. You think, well, why don't we just put loads and loads of them up? Well, the, the two disadvantages is their size. They're very expensive to build. If you've got a ground telescope, you can make that as big as you want it to be, encourage it back pocket and handle it, and also you can service it. Space telescopes are very, very expensive, very delicate instruments, 
they're also very expensive to launch. When you see a rocket sitting on the launch pad, 85% of the, of the mass of that entire rocket is fuel to keep the payload in the orbit. So that's, it's a huge thing to try and put something into orbit, so you've got to keep it as small and as light as you can possibly get away with. And the second disadvantage of space telescopes is you can't, with, notwithstanding a Hubble telescope, don't forget there's a good, you know, good 79 and the else up there, is you um, can't really service them and, and give them upgrades and so on. Remember that we looked about the Keck telescope and others, they've had upgrades with the adaptive optics and so on. You can't do that once something's up there, it's up there. Okay, so here were the six famous telescopes we're picking on. Remember last year we looked at the, um, the Spitzer which telescope, which is able to view the infrared part of the spectrum. We looked at Galex, which looked in the uh, ultraviolet part of the radius of the electromagnetic spectrum. And we looked at the Hubble, which is <coughs> predominantly um, optical or visual part of light, with a little bit towards the infrared and a little bit towards the, towards the ultraviolet. So tonight we're going to look at the Fermi Telescope, which views the universe in those powerful gamma rays. We're going to have a look at the Chandra X-ray Observatory, which looks at the universe with the X-rays. And we'll look at the James Webb Space Telescope, which is going to be launched next March, all done as well. Um, that's uh, going to be looking at this very powerful telescope with the infrared. Right. So just recapping where gamma rays sit, they sit right up here. These are the most shortest radiant, the most powerful light ray you can get. And that's the NASA's Fermi Space Telescope. Of course, um, it's designed specifically, which we'll talk about, to, to, uh, to capture and analyze these um, extreme energy gamma rays. That's it there. It was launched about 12 years ago. The Alpha 2 rocket um, is placed in a low Earth orbit, about 550 kilometers. So this is what it looks like. Uh, it has two main instruments. The LAT, or Large Area Telescope, is this is big sort of box up here and bulbs down here as well, and these gamma ray burst monitors. So the LAT is designed to do all sky surveys looking for AGN, that's active galactic nuclear, which we'll talk about shortly. Pulsar, which we'll talk about, it's also you'll find out in the movie how it picks up dark matter. It tries to find evidence of dark matter. Gamma ray burst, a quick, short, sharp burst of gamma rays, we'll talk about those shortly, and I have a whole talk on it, which I'm going to do later in the year. You see a picture of a technician to give you an idea of the size of it, there it is down here. I think he's trying on the side of the to deep there. But that, you know, it's a, it's a decent sized instrument. The other thing is you might say, is that a telescope? Really? That looks a bit odd. You know, where are your mirrors and stuff? Who designed that? What were they smoking on the day to design that? It looks crazy. Well, the reason it's that crazy shape is that it doesn't have mirrors. You can't just get mirrors and try and direct light on the detectors for a direct them in front of like you can a normal telescope. Gamma rays, photons, the little particles, are millions and millions of times more powerful than your average photon in optical wavelengths. To a, to a gamma ray photon, a mirror is just a big joke. Ha! A mirror! Humans have needed those. Just a joke, go straight through them. So how do you detect them? What you try and do is get the gamma rays to interact with the material, and then you look for signs of those interactions. And that's what we're going to, we're going to look up the hood of the short end and have a look at it and see, see what's going on inside. So that's, that's it. Now, for gamma ray detectors, there's two key methods that they use to monitor the interactions, Compton scattering and pair production. Essentially, in the process, as you're going to see, the LAT is actually a multi-level detector. It's a series of levels of detectors, and it detects the movements of particles. So let's have a look. Compton ray scattering. Compton ray scattering refers to when you get a really high-energy gamma ray that's, that's too sensitive or too powerful to report to or to detect directly. So it comes in, the collision source will allow it to collide with a charged particle normally an electron. The electron shoots off this way, gains energy and charges off at a certain angle at a certain velocity. Meanwhile, this high energy gamma ray 
has lost its loss of energy and has converted it into a lower energy gamma ray. And that photon there you can then detect, and you can also analyze the charged particle. How far it's going in which direction. Here it is, it's sort of a bigger picture of it. It's an incoming high energy gamma ray it collides with the charged particle electron. So it's the, the single one layer of detector here. There's your interaction. Here's the weaker one that's scattered. And this detector can then absorb the, the weaker gamma ray mm -hmm. and make it detect exactly where it's there. So the idea is you try and get it to interact and reduce its energy and analyze that and analyze the charged particle. That's Compton ray scattering. Here production, once again, if you get a really, really high energy gamma ray, as it interacts with the material, as it gets close to an atomic nucleus within that material, the energy of the gamma ray, as E equals mc squared, gets converted into mass, and it creates a pair of electron, and the electron's antimatter companion, or opposition, is called a positron, which is just the same mass electron, but with a different charge. The positron shoots off, eventually joins up with another electron, goes through an annihilation process, and creates another photon of light, which can be analyzed. Meanwhile, the electron can also be analyzed to see what sort of um, what sort of velocity and direction is there. And, and that whole process they can work out the energy of that gamma ray. And here it is here. Highly energetic gamma rays split into electron and positron. They are quickly going through the detectors and picking up the velocities and the directions. Bang, annihilation, a, lo a lower energy photon heading out. So that's how the pair production So it's a totally different beast to your standard telescopes than you used to. So you might think, okay, so that's what gamma rays are about. That's how you record and capture them and, and work out sort of what gamma rays are coming in. So what sort of sources out there in the universe create these extreme energy gamma rays? And the bottom line is it comes down to extreme energy events. So terrestrial on Earth, there's a couple. So first of all is nuclear fission explosions, atomic bombs going off. They quite happily produce plenty of gamma rays. In fact, the very first gamma ray detectors were launched into space in the 1960s with the sole prime purpose of monitoring other countries to see if they went, you know, they had a nuclear weapons treaty, was to make sure they weren't violating the treaty, so the whole world was watching each other. And in the process, they actually picked up these little bursts of gamma rays out there in the universe and realized, ooh, there's more going on than we thought. It was an accidental finding. So there's another terrestrial source of gamma rays. Can anyone tell me what it is? No chocolate, sorry. Mm -hmm. Lightning! Yeah, yeah. lightning string. So, um, quite happily, a strike of lightning can quite happily accelerate electrons up close to the speed of light. Um, and uh, when you get electrons accelerated up to those velocities, yep, they're going to give out gamma rays. There was a question once in the streets um, up at Long Crow Manly there, and it was some news, uh, it was some <coughs> news crew there, they were interviewing people at range and walking across the street. What's, where is it the hottest? Surface of the sun or in a lightning strike? Of course, everyone said, oh, oh the, the lightning strikes must be cooler than the sun must be hotter. But no, it's the opposite. The sun's surface is about 5,800 degrees Kelvin as opposed to about 10,000 degrees in a lightning strike. Okay, so where else in the solar system would you expect gamma rays to be coming from? Oh, within the solar system. Oh, yeah. yeah, the sun. So solar flares, large solar flares and mass coronal ejections, quite happily, uh, with the high energy events, they quite happily pump out gamma rays and x-rays. In fact, that's how you classify um, solar flares, is by the, um, the intensity of the x-rays they develop. Okay, collapsing massive stars. So you know that all stars over eight solar masses, that when they come to the end of your life, they collapse in upon each other, create a stellar, um, a stellar corpse, and then the, the, sh the shock of all them hitting the core, the rebound effect, you get a massive explosion, you get a supernova. Stars over the, age of uh, over the mass of 20 solar masses, they go what they call hypernova. 
in other words, it's a supernova on steroids, in other words, you know, a big, big, uh, grunty supernova. And those explosions are really, really, really intense, things the name hypernova, and they quite happily cause bursts of gamma rays coming out with some bipolar angles there. You can see. And that's one of the reasons we gamma ray this. So you can see why studying gamma rays is going to tell you a lot of what's going on in that supernova explosion. The other one is active galactic nuclide. That was abbreviation AGN. What an active galactic nuclide is, it's the bottom line, it's a supermassive black hole hanging out. Um, supermassive black holes refer to black holes millions of times the mass of our sun that sit right at the heart of most decent sized galaxies. Um, so black holes sit there quite happily. If a lot of material comes by, the material forms itself into what's called an accretion disk. And as the material falls in towards the black hole, they're losing, or rather, I should say, creating a lot of potential energy as it falls inwards, and that causes material charged particles to get spat out in jets, but like these bipolar jets here. Those charged particles also accelerate close to the speed of light. They hit the terror that's already out there, create massive shock waves, and that also creates gamma rays and creates X rays. They are very, very powerful events, and the energy that is given off as the material falls into the compression just gets quicker and quicker, closer and closer to the black hole, is far more powerful than any nuclear weapon or anything like that, or any nuclear material getting released. So uh, that, these are really highly energetic, energetic processes. Neutron stars, we talked about how large uh, stars greater than eight solar masses start to, to collapse down in the light of the stellar core. Well, stars from eight to twenty solar masses, they get themselves called a neutron star, which is really, really compact stellar corpse of a star. It's only about twenty to thirty kilometers across, but it's the mass usually of one to two suns. It's one of the most next to black holes. It's the most compact, dense object known in the cosmos. Because it's relatively small and it was relatively large, you're getting highly um, compact and powerful magnetic field lines around it. These babies also spin really quickly, hundreds up to a few thousand times per second. So you've got powerful magnetic fields just zip, 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 running out so, so quickly. What's happening? Charged particles are getting accelerated to huge velocities up to the speed of light. What do charged particles do if they approach the speed of light when they accelerate? They emit gamma rays and X-rays too. And so neutron stars do that, and they're also known as pulsars when they emit a beam of um, radio, radio radiation out, but essentially they're all the same neutron stars. So studying the gamma ray emission from these is once again another probe to study the physics that's going on in neutron stars. I've got a whole talk later on here on neutron stars. So essentially, yeah, these are mad boys up the universe, accelerating particles at a high speed. Supernova remnants, we've talked about the explosion of the supernova and how the, the, um, the whole process of the rebound and, and then the stellar remnant creates gamma rays and X rays. But suddenly, from that rebound, you've got material charging up the into the interstellar medium, the other little particle that's just minding their own business in space. All that material is you know, close to the speed of light, it's just ramming into, into material, rear ending it. And those are pretty violent collisions that are going on. They also will emit gamma rays and also X rays. So when you do an all sky um, picture of, um, of gamma radiation right across the sky, across the universe, this is what the CETUS was taken by um, Germany's predecessor, the Compton Ray Telescope. You can see this big strip across here, there's no, no, no price to guess what that is. And actually, this got the Milky Way, and these are almost certainly all pulses. These bright spots here, intense gamma ray emission, that's all pulses or neutron stars in the Milky Way galaxies. These ones out here, most likely are quasars. What are quasars? Quasars are active galactic nuclei, in other words, supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies that are picking out. The quasars are up in the end again. That's a whole different beast, and that from the early universe, so the very, very far away, 
but the legality for a lot of material that these supermassive holes to munch on. Um, so they're an active black nuclide, which is a supermassive black hole much of it, except this is an active black nuclide on steroids. These are really pumping out. So early, runty, active black nuclide. Okay, so here's just a um, nice little video of the uh, family summing all that up. There's 10 years. Project scientist. Since its launch in 2008, the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope has revolutionized our understanding of powerful events and objects in the cosmos. Fermi observes the universe using gamma rays, the highest energy form of light, more energetic than all the X-rays. Gamma rays are emitted by objects with extreme gravity and magnetic fields. Many of gamma rays Fermi sees are produced by black holes and incredibly dense, rapidly spinning stars called pulsars. From his predecessor, the Compton Gamma Observatory, collected data from 1991 to 2000, which was used to create this other star map. Okay, we're going to do Over the past decade. I'm going to move on from that. We normally calibrate this before we get started with all the IT problems we had earlier on. Go on well, we can time that. So we're going to get the IT people back in. Let's move on. The, the gist of it there, all the pretty much things I talked about um, are highly, highly energetic. Fermi Space Telescope has just opened up a whole branch of astronomy. Okay. So let's talk about the um, X-ray radiation. We'll, we'll have to get that problem sorted out with the rest of you guys here. Um, so X-ray, remember here, is just a little bit less powerful than the gamma rays, but once again more powerful than ultraviolet and optical wavelengths. And this is NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory Telescope. My favourite telescope, but a project I'm pulling it apart from of bolt by bolt. NASA yes, doesn't know that yet. <laughs> it was launched by the Space Shuttle in 1999, so it's over 20 years old, still producing very, very good data. That's it here, what it looks like. 
Um, here's your show, here's the input there where it picks up the gamma rays. I'm going to show you the mirror configuration up in here. Then you've got a high resolution and low resolution spectroscopy gratings sitting up in here. That's sort of up on hinges that drop down in the front, depending on which one you want to use. The light travels down here. That there is 10 meters long. So 10 meters, what, from here to the wall? That's how long the telescope is. It's a big, long thing in here, about to find out why. And way down the other end, you've got your camera and various detecting instruments. So this is, you might think, well, how do they capture these highly energetic particles? So X-rays, yes, are very energetic. <clears throat> As opposed to the gamma rays that just think mirrors were a joke and go straight through them, the X-rays show a little bit of respect for mirrors, whereby if you have it, if they hit them at sort of a grazing low angle, they will reflect off them. If you build the mirrors properly, with things like iridium and so on. So what they do, this is called a Walter Type One telescope optical design, and you put a series of, or a set of mirrors, one in a uh, paraboloid shape. So you've got circle and ellipse, and they're sort of what's called closed sort of systems, if you will. And then your parabolic curve is one that goes out like that, that doesn't close, which is hit like that. And a hyperbolic is even more extreme, it doesn't close. Oh, thanks, guys. I'll, I'll be there just about three slides. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, so, you, if you combine a series of uh, a hyperbolic and parabolic mirrors like this, you see the light rays, they're quietly grazing the, uh, the mirror, hit the second mirror, and then get focused down to a point, and that's where you're going to put all your instruments. So that's the principle of how you manage to capture X-rays. Still pretty powerful. You put a mirror in front of these X-rays, yep, the x is going to go straight through it. But if you have the mirror at a glancing angle, yep, it'll, um, the, the X-rays will, 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 will um, reflect off them. Now the next thing is, so because you haven't got a mirror like that face on, it's sort of more like that, it's glancing an angle, of course you haven't got a lot of surface area covering where the rays are coming from. But what do they do? They get nested mirrors. They put a whole series of mirrors in like that, just whole groups of them, and that dramatically increases the surface area. And as you'll find out shortly, is I think the next slide, it's actually much more than you think. So, the uh, Chandra telescope, this is its design, it has four mirrors all nested here, of, of hyperbolic and parabolic mirrors. You can see the light rays coming in, when you focus down the focal point, 10 meters away. The uh, X in, in Newton nested mirrors, a European agency uh, X ray telescope, which is also launched December 1999, so it's 20 years old as well, still running very well, has 58 sets of mirrors, such that its total surface area is 120 square meters. That's the size of a tennis ball. So if you imagine you've got, you, some of you have a telescope that's going to have a mirror the size of a tennis ball, and most astronomers would just be having a heart attack thinking about it. But yep, that's, that's how they get around it, they just mess them together. So what sort of um, sources in the universe give rise to these high energy events? Some of them are the same with the gamma rays, the supernova remnants, you've got these hot energy gases just ramming into, into other molecules in the interstellar medium, that gives out X-rays. You also get X-rays from the central star, the central star there, that, yeah, that's this, the um, pulsar in the middle of it all, that shines in X-rays as well. Cygnus X was the first stellar black hole. We talked about supermassive black holes. In stellar black holes refer to a small black hole just after a supernova explosion, and it's usually, say, two or three solar masses. And look at this image from one of the X-ray telescopes, just a big ball of X-ray. Really? I thought black holes, you know, they need to be, um, you know, black. They don't emit stuff. Look at this. A lot of black holes are in binary systems without the stars. What happens is you get a, a companion star, and the Cygnus is the X1's case, it's a blue supergiant, and the black hole siphons material off with the gravitational attraction, it forms into a accretion disk around the black hole, and as the, mat the material falls on to the surface of the right beta horizon, it gives off X-rays. The high energy process going on into there. So the black hole looks like that. Sagittarius A is a supermassive black hole at the centre of the Milky Way galaxy. And 
exit here that's uh, showing the heat strength. Once again, the material is feeding onto it. Not enough to crack it. Gamma ray jets and stuff, but certainly enough to emit X rays. Such a high density because it's a high energy event. Jupiter's aura, so all the charged particles um, coming back to the uh, due from the sun and so on. Jupiter's got very strong magnetic field lines around it, so the charged particles in the sun get whipped up at huge rates of acceleration and they emit X rays. So that's Jupiter through an X ray telescope. You see it's concentrated poles as well. Galaxy clusters, so that means you're referring to a cluster of numerous galaxies all gravitationally bound together. Within those clusters, you've got lots of gas that are traveling around at you know, millions of degrees of temperature. Those particles are all banging into one another, interacting with one another, and that typically creates this big uh, ball of, of um, X-ray emission. So if you look at a cluster of galaxies through an X-ray telescope, that's what you see. And that's how they actually work out and show the case of dark matter. Um, they see those particles running around at high velocities. There must be huge amounts of mass for that to be happening within the galaxy that you can't account for with the material you see. Dark matter, dark So now this is a little movie, so we're going to just bear with me for a couple of tips in here. It was at 12 30 in the morning, so it was dark. And my daughter, who was older, was awake and we wanted to go home. My son was actually asleep. And we woke him up just to see the Lord. When I stood there, three plus miles away, Until we saw x-rays uh, coming through and do that everything worked, uh, we couldn't really be too overconfident or relaxed or assured of success. I felt ecstatic. I felt unbelievably ecstatic. And uh, when we saw those first x-rays, the, the first time we got open, and I could see that they were being focused more or less into the right size area, I just broke into the biggest smile you've ever seen. When we looked at Cassiopeia A, uh, supernova, I mean, a star that exploded about 300 years ago. It's the uh, neutron star, the core of the star that exploded, collapses and forms a neutron star. And then we made that discovery in this official first light. Uh, we were very excited. That was an extraordinary time. I think uh, when I first realized uh, the telescope that was working. Um, I had a, a real sense of relief, uh, a real sense of elation uh, because of all the hard work that we've done. Um, I was incredibly proud uh, because of the team uh, and being part of that team. Uh, so it was, the requirement was that you had to work for three years and the goal was five. We we're 15 years into our five year lifetime. It's not too bad.
so many people have contributed much of their careers to the success of the CAD mission, and we're just to continue to, to reap the benefits of those uh, sacrifices that they made and the excellent science return that we're seeing from the mission, and we hope that it continue for years to come. You want to find black holes, you want to use an X-ray telescope. From various uh, astronomical observatories in space and on the ground, in particular Chandler being a major player, uh, we've determined that uh, most galaxies that are uh, as massive as our Milky Way or, or more uh, have a, what we call a supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy. Supermassive means that they, they weigh in at anywhere from a million to 10 billion times the mass of our own sun. What we're tending to find is that Cluster of Galaxies has a bright central galaxy in the middle. It's often an active galaxy or a quasar. So a supermassive black hole in the middle of a big galaxy. Because when the cluster is forming, a lot of the material tends to fall to the middle. So you get the biggest galaxy in the middle. You have cool material falling in, forming stars. Eventually, some of that gets to the black hole. The black hole can't take it all in, so some of it's going out. Radio jets, that heats up the material that's coming back. So there's a kind of feedback loop between the growing uh, black hole in the middle and the um, star formation that's happening in the cluster itself. We've known about the existence of dark matter for a long time. It used to be called missing matter, but now it's just dark matter because we know it's there. Uh, and uh, we know this in a number of different ways. So uh, Chandra's discovery of some things like the bullet cluster uh, is not a, a great surprise, but this is a situation, one of these train wrecks that you can see, and you can see that uh, these galaxies collided each other and what's happened is uh, very interesting and shows the presence of dark matter in a beautiful way. What we've now seen is that when there is two clusters which pass through each other and the gas got stripped out and the dark matter kept going and so they've actually en enabled us in really the only opportunity in the universe that, that at least I'm aware of to clearly separate the existence of the dark matter, which then you can detect by this thing called gravitational lens effect, and uh, and the the gas, and so these are this is like a uh, uh, you know a key scientific discovery to understand the nature of dark matter versus normal matter in the universe, um, and that's a, a very beautiful image uh, for me. It's it, it's beautiful because it combines together uh, data from Chandra, uh, Hubble Space telescope as well as the Magellan telescope, very powerful ground-based telescope. And it really, for me, um, shows how Chandra's science uh, can be powerful in, in, in multi-wavelength space. Important uh, uh, discoveries in astronomy and astrophysics was the discovery of dark energy, and that is that the universe is accelerating apart. What people are trying to do uh, using various different techniques, and again, in all the different wavelength bands, is to measure the parameters to characterize the dark energy. Chandra and X-ray astronomy is playing an important role in these measurements. But the universe evolves differently. It's not the universe we're in without it. Uh, I think that's most important. And secondly, if we're ever going to try to understand uh, cosmology, that is, the growth and evolution of the universe, is, and these are important constraints, boundary conditions, that have to be satisfied by any model that you may have. I, I, I usually make the mistake of saying dark energy didn't exist at the time uh, that we designed Chandra. Well, of course it existed. Uh, we didn't know of the existence of dark energy when we designed Chandra. So you see the power of an observatory, an observatory like Chandra with a, with a state-of-the-art telescope and these imaging spectroscopic capabilities of its science instruments can do things that maybe weren't even things that you planned on doing because you didn't know about them at the time. And, and a lot of the science that Chandra falls in that category. Yeah, the universe is a big 
big, big way. still producing great data, and as you can see, um, through measuring x-rays, you get to see right across the board, most processes and objects in the universe spit out x-rays of some sort, and you can see that leads <coughs> from this, you know, to confirming if it's having dark matter, dark energy, supermassive black holes, stellar black holes, and so on. So the infrared radiation, just recapping where that is, um, here's the uh, visual light, here it is here, so it's, it's just, what, uh, just a little bit weaker than what we can see with our eyes. We all right now are emitting in the infrared. So you've probably seen those infrared detectors we see when we walk around in the dark. But that's what we do. We emit the light from the infrared. A lot of processes do that. So the James Webb telescope has a lot of publicity. They have numerous setbacks. Well over budget, but it's meant to be for a year's time, guys. Maybe for March 2021. We've got fingers crossed. Let's have a closer look at it. Remember we've talked about with round telescopes, the number one spec when you're looking at buying any telescope from Andrew, asking how big is the aperture or the, or the mirror, the most impressed. That is the single most important specification for any telescope. So the James Webb Telescope's infrared space telescope, um, you all know the Hubble Space Telescope, primary mirror, 2.4 mirror, 2.4 meter mirror, 6.5 meter mirror. Now that's probably the size of half of this room perhaps. Yeah, about the size of half of this room and one massive mirror in space. It's just it's just a dream, isn't it? It's just a uh, an ultimate dream for a star that's, that's a real life picture of it outside the God NASA's God Art Space Center. It's north of Washington. So we're gonna have a little video on that shortly. What sort of sources involve infrared radiation? In particular, the, and you know, Spitz already does that, so James Webb is largest, so it's going to be able to pick up fainter objects, objects that are far away, so, and, and of course, low energy objects and things. So the very first stars and galaxies, at the moment we can't see them, they're just too faint, too far away. So the James Webb will be able to pick those up, hopefully, it's promising to, just because of the sheer size of the size of the mirror, we're going to catch more photons. The reason it's all in the infrared won't go see them because of course space time is expanded. The optical and the ultraviolet wavelengths have emitted from those stars have been traveling through space. That space over the last 13.8 billion years is quite a getting stretched and stretched. The photons within that space, of course, are getting stretched and stretched and stretched further out from those high wavelengths. So that's the first star to be seen in the very, very faint and I'll be in the infrared wavelengths. And that's what the James Webb promises to show us. It will also show very faint star formation that are going on. Star formation typically occurs in large molecular dense clouds, so the shroud is a lot of dust, that's like opaque optical light. When you look at an area like that, the infrared, you see so much more. I've got a picture of um, the pillars of creation from Eden Nebula from M16. This is a Hubble picture here, but it just it highlights the principle. That's through an optical lens detector, just looks a bit of pile of gas and dust. That same image, bang, here, in infrared, you look you cut straight through all that dust and you get to see all the stars inside the and new stars that are forming. So the James Webb is going to be really high definition, high resolution pictures of the star, early star formation going on inside these different gas clouds. Huge benefit to study gas star formation. Planets form, you know, nice, nice dusty accretion disks form around most young stars. But these are protoplanetary disks. This, this is an actual image of a protoplanetary disk that's around the star that's going to go on to the planets. This was taken by the Anacama Large Multi Millimeter Array. Um, these things are very faint, and once again, they are obscured by dust. James Webb Telescope is going to be able to see more and more of the stuff going on with a lot more detail in the element. Currently we're picking up exoplanets. Most of the views we're getting or detection of exoplanets is also indirect, just through dark, you know, the dark points dipping down as it you know, as transits and so on. So people say, oh, why don't they show us actually the image of these exoplanets versus past impressions? Because that's all we have at the moment, it's just all data. 
but for James Webb hopes to be able to look directly at shark images and directly study exoplanets, in particular analyze their atmosphere and look at the biosignatures, you know, in other words, signatures of life going on on those planets such as nitrogen, oxygen, and so on. That's going to give us a lot more data on exoplanets. Yeah, it's close to home. Um, so like in the Kuiper Belt, York Cloud, and so on, in the outer regions of the solar system, you know, there's loads and there's millions of very small bodies, but relatively far away, they're relatively small, so the plank, the James Webb should be able to pick these up a lot easier than the Kuiper Belt to, to, uh, to analyze them. And of course, there's a lot of information on the formation of the solar system, how it all started for us. So here's just a little loop on the James, on the James Webb. And lift off of the Space Shuttle Discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope. Before the Hubble Space Telescope launched in 1990, we didn't know how old the universe was. We had never seen another planet outside of our solar system. We didn't even know about dark energy. Hubble taught us a lot, but we can only see so far and in so much detail. To see farther, all the way back to the formation of the very first stars and galaxies, what's known as the universe's first light, we're going to need a bigger telescope. And that is exactly what started the largest, most expensive, and most challenging space engineering project humans have ever attempted, the James Webb Space Telescope. It's been over 30 years since work on this massive machine began, so when will it be ready? And how close are we to seeing the universe's first light? Since its beginning, the James Webb Space Telescope has involved thousands of scientists and engineers all over the globe. But all this work raises the question, what's so important about creating a telescope that's able to see the universe's first galaxies? The Hubble Space Telescope has been absolutely revolutionary in, in changing the way that we understand the universe. But we're really missing a key piece of the puzzle. We're missing the very start of how galaxies got started. When you know how to perform, when you understand the situation that this galaxy arises from, you understand the evolution force of that work and a better picture of what the universe was like back then. And it'll help us do things like predict what will happen to the stars and galaxies in our universe further on. What's going to happen at the end of everything? And if finding out how the world ends isn't enough for you, Webb will be able to do a whole lot more. The search for life is one of the, the big things that we're doing at NASA right now. It's really exciting. And Webb is going to make, I think, really groundbreaking discoveries in exoplanet science. I never know. We could get lucky now, personally, I hope. Mm -hmm. We find signs of life where the Webb Telescope is right. <laughs> yeah. Really, Webb is a multi purpose observatory. It will observe everything from the planets in our own solar system out to the most distant objects we can see and everything in between. And step one in building this, it turns out, starts with these. Have you ever been with a bunch of engineering type folks? And when you sit in a meeting, you want to talk about you know, some kind of structure. People grab and go to the I've got a water bottle and I'm sticking it up my phone. And, hey, here's the telescope. It's, it's great. So I just decided to build my own, you know, silly little model of James T and brought it in and uh, said, look, you know, instead of cup and phone, can you please just use this model? So how do we engineer this to see back in time? Well, it has to see in infrared. I'll let Dr. Strong explain. So if you think about, for example, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, this deepest image of the universe that we've ever had, we're able to see very, very distant galaxies. And if you pick out what the most distant ones are, you'll see that there are these little tiny red blips. They're so far away that the expansion of the universe has caused the light from those galaxies to literally be stretched into longer wavelengths. And longer wavelengths mean redder light. That's why we built the James Webb Space Telescope to be sensitive to the infrared so we can pick up where Hubble left off and really complete that very first picture to look at the very first stars and the very first galaxies. And Webb's ability to see infrared light really relies on three main things. It's mirror, it's sun shield, and it's orbit. Let's start with the mirror. 
It may not look big here, but that mirror is huge. Six and a half meters in diameter, to be precise. The reason why it's so big is really because we're trying to look at the very first stars and the very first galaxies that were formed. And they're very far away, and they're very dim. We're trying to collect one photon approximately every second. And so we're counting individual photons. So we need to be able to collect all of that light. Now, the reason the mirror is gold is that it reflects infrared light, making it easier to focus that distant light down into the instruments. But there's a problem. The sun also emits infrared light, which brings us to the sun shield. This part is also huge, about the size of a tennis court. So part of the job of the sun shield is literally to block the light from the sun, from reaching the telescopes and you know, messing up uh, all of the uh, uh, good ones that it's going to do. It allows the telescope to operate at a temperature that is about 30 degrees Kelvin. Room temperature is you know, about 300-ish Kelvin. So we are going very, very cold. And finally, the orbit. The James Webb Space Telescope is going far, like really far, 1.5 million kilometers away from Earth to a place called the Second Lagrange Point, or L2. So here's the sun. You have the Earth here. L2 is here. But when you go out to L2, you don't have the Earth and the sun filling half the sky. That's why we can use the sun shield to kind of cover them up so that all Webb sees is the dark space and be able to do its mission. So we need to launch all of this enormous, sensitive equipment on a rocket into space over a million kilometers away, which complicates things further because rocket launches are basically well-controlled explosions. In order to survive that explosion, it has to be designed to be very robust, strong, fast, coupled with the fact that the this T is also very large, um, means we have to design it very carefully to fit inside the rocket, then deploy it. It has to be right when you launch it. We have to test everything to make sure that it works correctly once it's in space, because we can't go fix it. That's what makes this project so unique. They won't get a second chance, unlike Hubble, which was serviced by astronauts five separate times. Webb has to be perfect on the first try, so understandably, that's taken some time to achieve. The James Webb Space Telescope was first scheduled to be launched in 2007 and was budgeted at $500 million. But as construction progressed and testing began, that launch date and that budget have changed a lot. This really is engineering at the extreme. It's pushing the edge of what's possible. As a scientist that's going to depend on this telescope for my future research, I'm here of another delay was, you know, it was sad. <laughs> uh, it's disappointing, but that's the reason we test, because we don't want these things to happen once we're in space. And that brings us to where we are today. With construction mostly complete, all that's left are the final testing stages leading up to the launch. The sun shield and the spacecraft element are currently undergoing thermal vacuum testing. And then after that, we'll undergo some more tests, some more deployment tests, those sorts of things. And then we will ship the whole observatory down to South America and for Chiana to prep it for launch. Once the telescope launches and is on its way to L2, it'll start to unfold in space. The entire process will take about you know, two to three weeks. I don't expect any of us to really be getting much sleep without time. The thing for me that is maybe the most scary is the deployment of the sun shield. There are hundreds of different individual sort of movable parts that have to happen during that deployment. Between it deploying and being fully tensioned up, the position requirement that it has to hold on all the space is not as much. So my job is to make sure that this thing, uh, through its manufacturing, through installation, through all the testing, and whatever happens to it on the orbit, but it holds to this much slot. After the telescope is fully deployed, there's still a few key things we have to do. We're going to tweak the mirror in order to make it perfect. And then we have science instruments, cameras, and spectrographs that we turn on one at a time. 
and we bring those up to working order. So this whole process takes a few months after launch to get ready. Only then, after testing, launch, and deployment, can we discover the mysteries of our beginnings. So how close are we to seeing the universe's first light? Well, so JWST team will be launching in spring of 2021. So about the summer to fall of 2021 is when we'll start getting the really first pictures back for slide. Our current theories in astrophysics tell us that we should be able to see those first galaxies with what? Of course, we don't know yet. We won't know until we look. But if the theories are right, then I think we should see the very first galaxies something like a couple of years from now, after Webb is launched, it starts taking its first data. Astronomy really gets to the heart of what it means to be human. It's asking these big questions that humans have always asked. You know, where do we come from? How do we get here? Are we alone? I think we'll answer questions that we haven't even thought to ask yet. And that is one of the most exciting things about any big telescope like this. We are creatures of curiosity and of wonder. This is an expression of it. I think the highest level that we can achieve. For more episodes of How Close Are We, make sure to check out this playlist here and let us know in the comments what you want to see us investigate next. Thanks for watching. Yeah, what's wrong? This is going to be pretty new breaking, isn't it? It's been a few months, the app is going out. Waiting for the first light. So, a little bit of homework. When you get home, what are you going to do? Go on the social media sites, Instagram, Facebook, whatever, and yet you'll find the James Webb Space Telescope up on the site here, and you can follow its progress right along until it gets launched. You may even want to sort of tell friends all about it. Maybe you've got any friends left by the time they launch it. <coughs> anyway, I know I have. <laughs> so, Space Telescope Part 2. Tonight I've shown you three more important observatories. Fermi Space Telescope use the universe and gamma rays, which reflect extremely energetic events, the most energetic processes that are going on in the universe without gamma rays. And you saw, you see right across the Milky Way, a neutron star with blasting gamma rays out, and you can see those um, quasars, which are really, really early, really grunty active, they can utilize elsewhere in the universe. So the Chandra X-ray Observatory, that observes the universe, which is a big High energy, not quite extreme, but still extreme. Too high, X-ray events, black holes, supermassive black holes, and so on. You can see those. And then the James Webb Telescope, hopefully all those will be launched in a year's time, which is looking for really faint, distant objects, um, and also objects in the far infrared that have been so old that the space time their light's been stretched out to the infrared. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> I apologize for the IT problems we have, but anyway, you get those in quick jobs. So, uh, yeah, any, uh, any questions at this stage? Uh, should I put the, put the lights on up a little bit? What's the object for the protoplanet? Oh, that was a small star yeah. with a protoplanetary disk around it, and that was an actual image taken from the Atacama Large Rock. Having said that, I once sprayed that with, with 
with someone and they said, uh, yeah, actually, it is a reasonable size. There is debris and stuff out there, but it's also, it's not it's one small point. It's, it's, a re it's a region. It's a region as opposed to a small point. So they'll be okay. Yeah. It's not kind of a region. Isn't that the kind of thing that call it the point itself? Yes, they don't sit there like this and go around. They actually, that region, they all did and so on. That's correct, Andrew, yeah. But yeah, there is a bit of, it is primary estate, there are a few other observatories up there, but it's not quite that congested. It's okay. So you can sleep tonight. <laughs> Otherwise, are we good? All good? Okay, um, so next month, we're going to talk about um, red dwarf stars and how favourable or not are they for the exoplanets around them for life to form. Because you all know that they're the most common cause of stars, they're very dim. Um, that's where we're most likely to find life. But really, how conducive are they for life? What are the conditions like there? Is it favourable, unfavourable? That's what you've got to decide next month when we have a talk on that. Otherwise, drive home safely and look after one another and have fun. And be kind. <laughs>